time to start. Oh my God. <laughs> Hold on. Here. Time to start the live stream. I think the, did you fix that? Good. Um, I'm your host, John Townsend, and I am on the other side of the time vortex, residing firmly in the 18th century, while you are not. But we're going to be talking about fun 18th century stuff. And I am joined by Lauren, who Hello. is in the chat. Say mm -hmm. it again. Hello. There she is. And then Ivy is on the console. Hello. In a really cool hat, but you can't see that. Anyway, we're going to be talking about wool. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I think it's, you know, the reason why we're talking about wool and not like a, is because we started on a, a, a whole project. Of, it's like, let's do an episode on 18th century fabrics. And we said, well, to even touch on 18th century fabrics, it'll be like an 18 hour episode. So Lauren broke this up, squeezed it up, and um, we're doing wool. And wool is one of the most... I mean, there are only just a couple kind of fibers to work with for fabrics in the 18th century, but it is um, a super important one. It's one that's used for all these outer garments, for everything that's high quality, for, you know, um, they're using it and exporting it. It's mostly a British thing and not necessarily an American thing, but the Americans, of course, are huge consumers of it. It was a gigantic industry in the Middle Ages and actually here in the 18th century, even though it's a major industry, it's actually coming down off of the highs it had earlier. So it is incredible. What they were doing was kind of incredible. It's hard to believe that they were uh, kind of achieving the kind of fabrics they achieved. And even today, we have a hard time finding some of the wools as high quality as the wools they had in, in the 18th century. In fact, today, wool is not that big of a thing. But, um, and most of it is mixed fibers and it's hard to find it anyway. Wool, 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 that's what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> um, do I need to talk about anything before we get into wool? I do have one super chat before we start. This is from Mandatory Carrie. Thank you. Oh, and I'll make sure to send this to baby girl Carrie. I think she'll be interested. So okay. someone he knows who, who. And I I know for a lot of people, they work with yarn wool. Because mm -hmm. that's what Ivy mm -hmm. and I both right. do. We, right. we do knitting. Mm -hmm. I do weaving. And for a lot of people, that's how they experience wool. And it's comes in so many colors and varieties. So. Yeah, it's fun stuff. Some people are all complaining, oh, it's scratchy, but that's just because we're not making it from as high a quality of wool as they did in the 18th century, and we're whiners. <laughs> that's just all there is to it. Um, uh, what was last week's video? Last week's video was? Uh, Valley Forge. Was it Valley Forge? And then Beef Stew before that. Okay. Uh, yeah, Valley Forge video, um, beef stew video. Um, the Valley Forge one was one of those ones where you, you do all this research. Now, on a lot of videos, it, it is one of these where you, even the live streams, you do research, you do research, you do research, and you're, it's, it's like this big pile of information in your head and you're slowly trying to turn it into some kind of story so you can deliver it and... <sighs> It's either like, it's, this should be a full-length movie, or ah, it'll be done in three minutes, and there you go. <laughs> anyway. Um, let's jump in and start looking at pictures, yeah, let's, right? Yeah, let's go to picture number one. There we go. Um, so, we've got classic woolen garments here. And we've got a super, super high-end um, wool coat on one hand from the 1730s, and then... On the other side here, we've got a regimental coat, um, military regimental coat, and um, it's from 1776. Not a giant uh, difference in what's going on with the cut necessarily, but we certainly have um, the same kind of color. And these are these wools, even though like a military coat, this one's got gold braid, so it's probably a little, it's probably an officer, but regardless, uh, even the kind of lowly 
uh, soldiers' coats were actually made from a fairly fine grain of, of wool. In some cases, when they cut these, like the lapel part on that one that has the green lapels, they they weren't they weren't a binding cut. When we when we do uh, or a binding seam, um, when we do seams on the outer part of coats like that today, <clears throat> we would always turn those inside and they would be caught inside of a seam. And on a lot of these coats, they're just they're just like cut with scissors right along the edge. And a, a wool today would fray or any kind of fabric would look would fray and look goofy and and of course we wouldn't do that but the wools of that time period were so fine that um, you could cut them like that and it would not make a bad looking garment um go on to the here we go i, I gotta buy it. i can make it happen with the magic over here um <clears throat> Here are two women's garments from the time period. Again, a fancy early uh, 17th century um, dress slash gown and a 1740s plain woman's uh, garment. Again, both made of wool and simple things um, and fancy things. So you, you have you know every gamut basically with wool. Wool is a very, very versatile fabric. One of the great parts about it is, is that it, as a fabric, it lays very nicely. Um, it, it, uh, it doesn't wrinkle like some of the other fabrics, especially linens. And it, um, it's not something that you want to wash a lot, but it's fairly easy to clean by brushing it. So the process from, of wool uh, obviously it starts with the sheep and this is an early, early image that kind of shows us a whole bunch of the process going on with wool. Even there's probably a sheep way in the background, I can't tell. Um, <laughs> there is in the other picture. Yeah. Right, right. So in the very uh, top um, left hand corner, we have a waterway and people processing wool in it. It's very, very small, so you know they just kind of threw it in there. But those white things laying over the bridge, those are um, fleeces or sections of wool that they have uh, just they're drying after they've washed them. And washing the wool is incredibly important to any of the later processing. So the sheep are always their, their, their wool is all full of dirt and straw and grass and all this lanolin oil and you you have to do lots of washing to it before you do anything with it. So just below the bridge there on the extreme left hand side we see someone with a stick and a big pile of wool and he's probably just he's just beating the snot out of it. Um, probably because he's just washed it and beating is one of the ways that you get the water out, you get the dirt out and probably he's just taken out you know his frustrations on that um bottom left hand corner we have a small person a child and they're holding that basket likely what they're trying to represent there is the picking of the little pieces of dirt out of fleeces so you've got all these little pieces of grass some of that washes out some of the dirt washes out but then all this vegetable matter just plain has to be separated. And it's one of the jobs that even the smallest children could start to do immediately. They might not be great at it, but hey, they got nothing else to do. You know, they could be playing outside or they could be working on your fleece. We're going to make them work on the fleece. <laughs> <laughs> the person just to the right of that with the green pants, kind of a, sort of in the center there, he is combing wool. He is, there are two kinds of ways of separating wool at this point. You can comb it with, um, with these, these long combs and hooks, or you can use, what is it? The uh, carding. Uh, yeah, carding it. I don't know why. <laughs> why Stupid why that brain. One? <laughs> anyway, carding, which is another kind of combing technique, but it isn't the combing technique you use for really long fiber wool. So the longer the fiber, the better the wool is, the less scratchy it is, the more uh, high-end it is. If you want to do super nice worsted wool things, uh, then you need these super long wool fibers. If you're going to be making something not high, high class, you comb it. And then if you're using very short fiber, 
you felt that. And so something like the hat I'm wearing, which is made of wool felt, and some rabbit uh, um, rabbit felt also, that's where that kind of lowest quality wool goes. We got some other people uh, dealing with wool here, beating it with sticks, probably again cleaning it. There's somebody at the top. I don't know what they're doing, sprinkling water on it. Who knows what? And then these two uh, people on the extreme right-hand side, and they are, they're actually dealing with wool that's on the hide. So you can shear your sheep. And you can also deal with the wool off of a sheep's skin. And sometimes they do that and somebody's like moving it down to shearling where they're shearing off of the hide itself. And I don't know what exactly what, not everything is explained to us in these images, but here we go. This is um, 18th century, right? This particular one? Uh, hold on, let me see if I can find the information yeah. for this one. This is another one of these a little later on. It's not so stylistic and gives us again, the entire wool process. So we can see sort of the end of the process here in the top left where we have bales of wool and then we can go down to the bottom. We see the river and we see people washing wool and they've got these sort of troughs and they're basically stomping on on the uh, wool and and cleaning it that way. There's a job for you. It's like oh, I, I'm a wool stomper. Uh, <laughs> It goes up for after being cleaned in the in the river. <clears throat> it goes up into these vats where they clean it with hot water. This might also be some dyeing processes and things like that. Eh, maybe I doubt it. Dyeing is a lot more complex than just hey, let's toss this wool into a vat. Let yeah. me tell you. And most of the things I ran across talked about dyeing it when it was spun into thread. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. And that makes a lot more sense. So this is just a cleaning, again, a cleaning process. And then we have these, it looks like a, looks like a, like a pen with a bunch of snow. That's of course, <laughs> have wool over there. Uh, again, there's another pen um, and, and uh, they're raking the wool. I don't know what they, <laughs> they even have scales for weighing the wool. And, and they talked about the very precise measurement of yeah. how much wool you packed into these bales. Right. And in, of course, we think of wool as fluffy, but these bales, obviously, you get enough oh. of the wool and they're oh, yeah. pretty hefty. And they're going to pack it tight. Yeah. Um, and they're hauling it around. We, so, yeah, we got lots. There's this. Here's a close up of the uh, the pens. There's, they, we're seeing a little bit more of the image now because we kind of moved over on it. Uh, so there, there's a the little round pen that has the wool where they're packing it into the bag. And same thing in that upper one. They're raking it around um, and they're making big fluffy balls of wool. <laughs> and we also have sort of in the in the foreground here, we have the people that apparently, I don't know, were they bathing in the river? Yeah, they were. I, I There is a bit cut off, but it, it's, it pictured that as well. Like maybe this was a like, you're like, well, we're washing the wool, might as well get washed ourselves too. Or maybe that was a first step, so you didn't get the wool dirty. Uh, I'm not sure, but they, they're drying off. From maybe, but I mean, if we look at that other one, they all have clothes on. And That's true, yeah. I mean, one, I guess, has his shirt off. I don't, one of them looks like he has a, like a leopard skin on. This is 1651. Yeah, but 1651 no, no, I people just, aren't wearing I, leopard skins. I, I just figured I'd tell you what date that we, we had for this one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 1651, obviously the gentleman here the in the lower kind of left foreground, he's the overseer looking yes, over Yes, with his that. collar. Yeah, he's got a collar there and, and he's got a little booth, right? Probably <laughs> so he can stand out of the rain while other people are working in the rain. I'm wondering whether these guys were actually bathing in the river trying to get all that lanolin on them. It could be, and this someone's commenting that they may be raking it to help it dry. So they're like, maybe. they're moving the dry um, section mm. maybe on the top to, to uh, off to the side to let the under, the next layer dry. Yeah, and all of these workers working at once, they even have kind of a collective uh, eating ground in the background. Notice how they're trees, and this is like the specific resting eating spot. 
mm-hmm. that, that is made in this working location. Very, very interesting. And then we can see the sheep and the deep background and all that kind of good fun stuff. Uh, there's a book about tending sheep and all the sheep goodness of how you deal with them, husbandry, etc. Um, and in it has listed here the this is the table of contents about the kinds of sheep. Um, so they start off with you know class one sheep, sheep without horns, <laughs> and class two sheep, sheep with horns. Uh, this. This didn't make sense to me, and I'm sure it makes sense to people who have sheep, but that is not how I would have classified right, sheep. Right, I mean, I would think big sheep, little sheep, short-haired or, yeah, sheep, short long-haired, long-haired sheep, I don't I, that's know. That's what I would have thought, Why but nope. they would separating horned horns, not and horned. not horned, we don't know. Maybe someone here in the audience is a super sheep person yes. and can tell us why they separated them this way. Mm-hmm. But we've got... Um, Dishley and Lincolnshire and Teeswater and Cotswold, obviously these are all in England uh, or in Great Britain, uh, Southdown and Hedgewick and uh, Chevio and Dunfaced Sheep and Shetland Sheep and then Horned Sheep, Shropshire, Exmoor, Desertshire, um, Norfolk, all these, Merino or Spanish mm-hmm. sheep, which have really high end. Uh, soft. Uh, yeah, soft wool. Well, I liked the idea of forest sheep. It, forest sheep? Yes. It's right there, right above the merino, I think. Really? Yes. Oh, mm-hmm. yes. Short or forest sheep. Mm-hmm. Can you s- I can see them now. Right, roaming around anyway. in the forest. And there to fill up the other side, there's uh, a picture of Exmoor sheep with their horns. <laughs> hmm. I just was very fond of this particular picture. That's why they made it in. Well, they do look very goat-like. They, they look like they can take care of themselves, which yeah. I like to know that my sheep could do. Yes. Um, there's the uh, old Norfolk uh, horned breed. And then a picture of the the Exmoor, so, or the Chevy. Uh, the, the Chevios are supposed to have long nice, Yes, nice, yes, that's nice, one nice of them. Nice so I was digging, and it's really easy, like in this circumstance, there's a book here, it's a great a book from Great Britain, and it's got all these, um, you know, all this in- interesting information about um, sheep from the time period, and wh- what they thought about it, how they dealt with it, what they breeds they thought were good or bad. And it's a lot trickier when you're saying, okay, um, what's going on in North America at the time? What do they, what do they think about sheep? What are they doing? Is there a lot of wool production? And it turns out that uh, in North America, they're really sheep were not a big thing. We didn't have a lot of really nice um, sheep. Our environment wasn't even that particularly good for sheep at the time period. Um, a lot of people are kind of working. There's like less civilization and there were a lot of problems with wolves um yeah so you know we don't think about that many wolves today Uh, even they even you know brought wolves back in some particular places but they had a lot of problems with wolves and wolves and sheep they don't go together except for lunch and they the the kind of environmental climate problem um it was a little too cold for sheep so Um, There wasn't a lot of sheep things going on in in North America, at least very high end. And it wasn't until, say, 1800 or even a little later when they started to bring in and breed up better breeds of sheep specifically for North America and and for uh, high end wool production. So most of what we're seeing here is from the continent of Europe and Great Britain. And um, um, I'm hitting a button. There. Um, the cleaning of the wool here in this image, we get a close up. Again, we have the wool rake, we got a basket, and someone working within the river. Sometimes you even see these baskets. Now, here, you can't really kind of get the interpretation of it, but I believe that the basket is worked upon these two slanted poles. To the one pole here in the very foreground, of course, is holding up the roof. But behind that are two poles at an angle. And I believe that the basket is hooked on those and it hinges down below and you can pick the basket up. 
Ah, yes. Right? And I've seen this kind of image before where um, there isn't a building, but the person is working at the water's edge and he's got a basket with these two long poles and he leans back and it, and it comes forward or comes, comes up out of the water. So I believe that's what we're going on in this particular image. And in the background, we see probably, you know, yarn hanging from these poles. You think that's what that uh, is? Yes, I think that's what right. it's depicting. So mm -hmm. like it's, again, dealing with, uh, well, I don't know what. I'm not sure why they're doing it at the river's edge. I, I think this particular picture was in a block of other, the book is just kind of talking about a different subject and it's using, it's like an A, B, C, D, and ah. like this is wool. And so, so they, they, were just, them together. they were just putting another image of wool right. in the background as uh, right. atmosphere. There we go. I like atmosphere. Uh, that's my interpretation of what's going on. <laughs> um, we have shearing. And uh, we've got people washing the sheep before. It's like, why, why bother to wash the wool afterwards? Maybe we should scrub our sheep first. <laughs> yes. You know, you think maybe that would be the best thing. Step why not one. Even, why not even just comb your sheep straight up front? Right. Maybe they'd like it. Just get a big old comb and start combing just it in brush the water. The sheep and brush it. And then you can cut the wool off. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lot of sense to me. Anyway, we got people shearing and cleaning sheep. We got their little, very, very simple, fun little barn with a thatched roof. Got another image of shearing here when you do have that classic kind of set the sheep on their butt. Yeah, it always looks a little awkward, but boy, can they shear a sheep fast. Yeah, well, with the electric ones. Well, and in fact, today. when I was looking through images in the 19th century images, mm -hmm. there was one of a sheep shearing contest. Ah, how fast so, you can do it yes. even by hand. Ooh, I'll bet you get some like hand muscles with those. Yes, you can see I the shears there. Um, those are not easy to use. You know, you got to get used to that. You got to hold them just right and, you know, work them so that they actually cut instead of just gum it and then you got the poor sheep causing trouble the whole time i don't know some of them seem calm and i want if it maybe if it's their you know fourth year of being sheared they're like yeah it's time to get sheared all right and if it's their first year they're a little yeah. I, i've never sheared a sheep so i, I imagine... have seen some sheep that were sheared that were like had a little bloody patch yeah they so. weren't happy about the process and they weren't making it easy i don't know <laughs> Now, these people really are just, just, just beating that wool with sticks. Um, this image, you can see it's got ABC123 kind of thing uh, explaining what's going on here. I don't think it needs a whole lot of explanation, except the idea here is that this wool is probably in it just after the cleaning process, and this is the beating it dry, and then we can even see... In number three there, onto the right, uh, he's hanging up the clumps of wool so it can dry up in the air. But first, these two guys are going to hit it with sticks. Yep. Step one. Or uh, I'm sure step they would never at. lean across that table and whack each other. No. No, never. Never, never. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, there, you, you can just see the extreme left. There, there's a little pen there, and there's wool down in that. Um, what do they call this one, Lauren? Uh, this... Wait, which one are we at? It says it, washing. They're washing, and it's I wasn't as sure about the interpretation of this one. They seem to be... I don't know if they're washing it after it's been in a certain process. Mm. Uh, yes, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not... But this <clears throat> one was in a group of three, yeah. and so I, I didn't It's wool wanna... washing. Uh, there you go. That's what that one was. <laughs> and then we have the combing process. And uh, we have um, over here someone with a, he's sitting on a, a works kind of bench specifically made for uh, doing the, uh, the carding kind of process. It's like there's a fixed card and then this comb. I don't, it's hard to tell whether he's combing or carding because um, they, they're similar, but one's really working on longer fiber than another. We even have a little wood stove to keep it warm and dry. And then somebody's doing something, and then somebody else doing something. See, unfortunately, and the then, explanation for this right. particular picture was in French. Right. So, um, right. and our French. My French 
was not up for this translation. And then the far side at the right hand side is that's sort of like you can wring it tight and squeeze all the water out of it. Uh, here we have someone in the 19th century and they are carding. And this is, you can see the cards here. It's like two boards sort of look like square ping pong paddles, but they have these little metal hooks uh, that come together. And then at the bottom, we have the basket of uncarded wool, and it just looks like tufts of dumb stuff. It, and then yes. you, I, I really loved how the picture right. so clearly displayed. You're like, right. this one's not ready to work with, and look, it's, and then on the other it's side, transformed it. Right. And then on the other side are these nice, fluffy rovings. That's what it's called when you, when you get this the wool, and it's all carded out, and it doesn't have uh, it's all. All the fibers are aligned properly, right? Yes. Are people making having fun there? They're, they're having a great time. I'm really uh, loving the fact that there's a lot of people who are directly connected yeah. with this process, who have had sheep mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. shear the sheep and or know somebody who has and exactly. done the carding and spun the wool. So it's lovely to hear everyone's story. Great. Great. So here we got uh, somebody who is uh, carding along and she looks so happy. She just can't <laughs> wait to do the rest of that basket. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. She's <laughs> so excited. <laughs> well, there, that is one of the things that uh, certainly came to mind while processing these pictures is how much how long this process yes. took and oh, how, yes. especially the, the spinning, it's just something you do all the time. It's like yeah. one of those chores that you just you you don't have anything out. to do. Okay, it's time to start spinning now. Yeah. And it's never done. Uh, again, working on this long, um, long fiber process here, the combing. Um, and we can see he's got these, you know, like giant rovings in the background and these, I mean, it, it, they look like giant fluffy lemur tails or something. <laughs> I, they're not in, in this image. Um, I'm not sure why he's got a big jar behind him, but yeah, probably where he... I liked his wool basket, though. I wanted his, his basket drink. that he has the yeah. wool in. Yeah. Here's uh, someone in a more modern day. Obviously, they're not... <clears throat> they were in a historical context, but anyway. But, yeah, were... I chose this because this was the best picture I could find uh, do, doing the drop spindle. Right. A lot of the, there were yeah, some period, period yeah. pictures of the drop spindle, but they weren't as much in action. So right. I thought this one. So we have the drop spindle down there um, below her. And she is have the has the roving in her right has the yes the roving in her hand and then the spinning process happens right between her fingers there at the bottom edge of that so you'll spin the drop spindle and it'll go down and then you'll uh, wind those little fibers together watching people uh, do that with a drop spindle it's like oh, okay what kind of magic is going on it's here really fun. yeah imagine doing that all day yeah mm. but. I, I, it, it's, I'm sure it becomes a soothing process, kind of like knitting, sure. where you get used to it at a certain point. It's just, it, it's not really a drudgery. You just off you go to do some more spinning. That's what the, some the people say. The carding looks a anyway. little more labor intensive than the spinning <laughs> does to me. <clears throat> Here's an image from later on in the 19th century. And it's likely here she's not necessarily doing wool, but linen. Could be flax, yeah. Flax. Um, anyway, uh, the same image, you know, same thing going on here. We've got a uh, spinning wheel. Um, we've got the, the he in this case, probably, you know, flax. And then we've got a nitty knotty to deal with the, uh, with the, with the uh, spun uh, yarn that comes off of the spinning wheel and again very she looks happy of course she's I mean that one she's got a little hand crank and a foot crank I don't know how that works maybe so she can anyway next <clears throat> um, a walking wheel so sometimes you use um, a walking wheel, which is a much bigger spinning wheel where you stand and you can kind of walk backwards with the thread and, and uh, wind it all up. Uh, so we have uh, most of the process going on here. There's a little bit of wool sitting on the, 
sort of like rovings there that she's going to spin and um, thread is spinning up that we've got a child in the background who's doing some kind of cleaning slash dyeing or something like that and then someone using the finished uh, product the finished yarn and they have a little tape loom and they are weaving up uh, some kind of little band Uh, this is the front part of a, the art of, um, it's actually, isn't this from the dyer's assistant? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just grabbed this so that people right. could see a bit more of the range of what was offered. Right. So what happens when you've got the, the wool, it's already spun, spun into yarn and now you want to dye it into different colors. And, uh, I have a section here out of the dyer's assistant. And today, when we think about dyeing, we think, oh, let's see. Um, you have this kind of like tub, and it's got this red stuff in it, like food dye or something. And you dump, dip the stuff in, and poof, it comes out. And, you know, it's all this perfect color. And, wow, nope. the process is uh, nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, this is uh, a section here about dyeing with madder. And um, madder is one of the classic red colors from the time period. And um, there are higher end red colors. Some of them uh, coming from cochineal or the little red bug. Um, there are other kinds of crimson and uh, kind of scarlet colors that are coming out of more expensive reds. But matter gives you a nice intense red, but it's the least expensive. So probably one of the most popular ones, especially for red coats. So if you've got a red coated soldier, um, that, that um, wool was probably dyed with matter. So the root of matter, the root of matter is the only part of its plant, which is used in dyeing. And of all the reds, this is the most lasting when it is put on cloth or stuff that is thoroughly scoured, then prepared with salt with which it is to be boiled uh, two or three hours, without which uh, the red, so tenacious after its preparation of the subject, would scarcely resist more than the proofs of reds than any other ingredients of false dye i.e. if it's not prepared properly, the matter is not going to stick on this uh, wool at all. So it talks about scouring the wool. So the first thing we have to do is to strip the wool of any kind of lanolin and prepare it so that it will, so these dyes can get into it. So if there are the, any of the natural oils in there, it can't, it won't dye at all. So we have to scour it and then it kind of opens the pores or so this says, of the, um, of, the, of the wool. So we scour it, which is cleaning it. A lot of that cleaning is with urine. And it talks about, dyeing has a lot of talking about urine here. And it's that, if you look at that laundry process way back, we did it, the whole series with, uh, with Maggie, uh, Carol Jarbo, and she was talking about urine. And what happens with urine is you let it set and it turns into ammonia. And the ammonia is what's cleaning that out. So we don't use fresh urine. That would be a bad thing. But particularly, we let this urine turn into ammonia. And then we use it for that scouring process. And there are other kinds of salts um, here that it talks about um, getting that wool ready so it accepts the, uh, the, the dyes. And even then, it's not easy. Let's see. Um, there's the, there's the, he talks about where the matter comes from and there's different kind of matter from different places and whether or not it uh, gets oxidized or not and it can, can uh, not work very well. There was a really interesting section here about um, boiling. I'm not sure if I can find it again. I was gonna highlight it, but um, um, I was trying to get the, the um, the man who was uh, printing this out to do it faster, and he, he was being very bad. Um, there's a section talking about overboiling it and ruining the color of red. So 
Matter can give you a very handsome red, but if it's improperly treated, it will give you this kind of mm, brick color, which, yeah, it's red, but it isn't very, uh, very nice looking. So uh, lots and lots and lots of stuff on dyeing. And this whole particular book is, I think it's translated from the French. Um, it's from the 18th century and um, it's dyeing all sorts of colors. So we would look at today, you know, we would think, oh, this is the perfect book. Um, this will help me understand how to do some period dyeing. And it is very difficult to kind of extract modern day uh, dying from a lot of this because we don't have the kind of materials or even understand what they were kind of referring to when they, you know, like crude tartar. I don't know, crystal of tartar, crude tartar, I need this for the, I don't, where am I going to get that? I don't right? know. Right, and like baking, yeah. it has to be very, the the very specific ing yeah. ingredient or you'll yeah. get something, it just won't be the same thing. Yes, it's it's chemistry, and yep. um, if you can't understand what they what they actually meant uh, or get the kinds of things they were talking about here, uh, it can be very difficult. So, um, lots and lots of stuff in the dyeing book, and we're gonna jump back in, or else I'll never get through this. Okay, here we go. Um, we have people working with yarn, so we've got someone here with a cat who's not helping them. And she's winding the, the yarn up. Now, we think of skeins of yarn. Um, yarn's, yarn is not sold in balls because the ball is apparently bad for the fibers, can stretch them and make them not good. So, so you know, you might use a, turn it into a ball for making it directly into a project very quickly. But if you're going to leave yarn laying around, it needs to be in these kind of ropes or skeins so that it doesn't um, break the fibers in it. So we've got one person here rolling a ball. We have another person here with their swift that they've had uh, yarn wound up on and they're they're again rolling it up into a ball so that they can probably do some hand knitting which was very popular in the time period uh here's someone who's got are they doing a four or three needle needle i think uh, it's a four yeah they're I, probably knitting um in the round well they're falling asleep but they're knitting in the round <laughs> he was, uh, a lot of people <laughs> in modern times would use a needle with kind of a plastic thing between them. Um, but in the period, they would use four needles. And Sometimes what... people still use four yeah, needles sure, for exactly. knitting in the round. It's nice. Yeah. Um, you also obviously do lots of weaving, and this loom is heavy duty. <laughs> so they got this super heavy duty loom. Uh, tubs around there, I don't know. Don't ask me why. Sometimes, if you're depending on what you're knitting, like uh, linen, you do need to wet it at times so that the fibers stretch out just right and it knits pro or uh, weaves properly. Wool, you wouldn't need that. Um, this is a Hogarth of the Idle Apprentice. We have the one hardworking apprentice and then the Idle Apprentice over here who has drank too much beer and has fallen asleep at his loom and he's about to get hit with a stick. Uh, this is an indenture of a person who was indentured to... What were they indentured to do? Oh, they're apprenticed to a broadcloth weaver. Oh, yeah, that's right. A broadcloth weaver, which, which makes total sense because the last image there was a an apprentice for weaving. And uh, it even has, if you read closely there, it says, uh, shall not contract matrimony within the said term, shall not play cards, dice, tables, or other unlawful games. It's like you want your... <laughs> You're like, like, to no, be no, diligent. No. <laughs> you got to be diligent and don't be doing these dumb things. Um, so there we go. Um, one of the things that's a little strange uh, to understand is what's going on with the fabric after it's woven. And here they're doing some preparation, some pressing and glazing and shearing. So they've got these big funky kind of scissor things that cut the, cut the fabric fluffiness off. 
Right. To, to, so it's smoother. You just right. trim off what's not smooth. Yeah, exactly. Which seems strange because one of the things you also do is you full fabric where you actually kind of comb it after it's woven to pull fibers out of it to make it fluffy. I'm not sure if those are just two different fabrics that they're trying to achieve two different mm -hmm. finishes or if like you do one first and then do the other like first you get it all and then, it, you, and, then... and then you trim it so and maybe they have different height shears for different fabric finishes. Yeah, something like that. Uh, so here's a different picture there. They've got the big weird sheer things and the fabric there. I just don't, I don't understand it. I, I really like this, the thing on the floor though. So apparently, I don't know, he walks back and forth. Uh, he doesn't want to wear out his, his legs. And so he's on this board that's springy. I, I, the board did like, I guess like we have squishy mats. Yeah, it would keep you. That's his squishy mat. I, I guess. I, I, I had wondered if it had something to do with the actual process he was doing, but maybe but instead it's just to keep him, you know. I mean, if he's got to stand there for eight hours doing this Yeah, thing, and it kind of looks like he does do that all day long. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, so here we have people, they're, I don't know, winding it up. And and then the this is a kind of a fulling action over here, the two people with... I, they're supposed to be, those are probably teasel heads. Yes, it. I believe it actually said that in the description right. that it so was teasels. Those are teasel heads, which I, I don't know if you're familiar with teasels, but they're kind of like big thorny or a big uh, uh, thistly things that dry out and are scratchy. Uh, how do you describe those? Anyway, they would take these little plant heads and they would mount them on those little sort of paddle things and they would use it to pull the fibers out of those uh, fabrics to give you an almost felted finish. But not quite. But not quite, because <laughs> that would be felt. Um, but yeah, so that that's what's going on there. And then apparently here they're pressing it. Uh, they squishing. It doesn't make any sense to me, because you'd think you'd squish like folds into it, you know? Well, but I, to me, I assumed that they like pulled it onto the flat surface, squished it, pulled it onto the flat surface again, squished it again. That's just not what it looks like, though. Okay, maybe they squish it and then they pull it through as it's being squished? I don't think so. <sighs> <laughs> I don't know. But I, I did get the sense that they, yeah. that each piece got its own pressing. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. mm. um here, there are multiple sample books from the 18th century that still exist. So somebody was going around selling fabric, and these are samples of fold fabric. So that's why you can't see the weave, because it's been teased out. And, and you can see all these crazy colors. Colors that you kind of, you know, it's like, I love that avocado, doesn't it? Yes, um, and you're like, amazing. So red, white, orange, light blue. We got purple and yellow and all kinds of fun colors. There, uh, these were, uh, you can read there, uh, for export to the Eastern Mediterranean region. Why the Eastern Mediterranean would need a whole bunch of wool, I don't know, because you would think they'd be warm enough, but you need wool. Actually, the great thing about wool is it, it's, it's not that bad, even in summer. We wouldn't think about that, but they, they didn't have a problem with that. Well, and um, the, I'm sh from the descriptions of some of their wools, they were so light, like yeah, thinner exactly. than what really even the worst if fully than even most of the worst that i would have run across they're right. just incredibly light wools that they come up with and it, it acts almost like a silk in that yes. it is still warm in winter but if it's that thin it's it's light in the summertime as well very very true we we wool has a bad name today. well it, it is harder to care for it is. you can't yeah. just toss it in the, in the washing machine and that's i think sure. that's what um, what kind of was one of the things that took it down as a common right. fabric was not its usefulness, but its care. Yeah. Because you need to treat it a certain way, and then it will be a, a wonderful fabric for you. That's right. 
Um, we have an advertisement here from the time period, uh, and they are have they have super fine and middling broadcloths that are scarlet and crimson, green, blue, white, fashionable, mixed, and both color and cloth colors. Um, then we talk about different kinds of fabric types, ratines, coatings, shalloons, tammies, hairbines, uh, Colchester and drapery bays, um, and uh, different kinds of blankets. And sometimes when they say blanket, they just mean the kind of, of weaving. Um, and then they might just mean blankets. Milled and worsted caps, Irish and French, French linens, um, and then they go on to tell us they have calicos and gloves and chocolate, and <laughs> lemons. I like that. How, how to, I wonder if they have lemons. Oh, no, I can see it <laughs> just by looking. Um, that's Portsmouth, 1781. And that's in America. Um, and then we have a, we get kind of, more machinery slowly in the industry as we go through the 18th century. And here is a carding engine that um, looks very complex, but will we'll automatically card a whole bunch of wool for you and kind of stretch it out. I don't know exactly how this machine would work. It'd be fun to see it in action today. And here is a spinning jenny. So instead of having one person spinning one little spool, uh, this spins, you know, 50 and 100 at a time automatically. Making a huge difference. Yes, making a massive uh, difference in the amount of people that can do uh, work. This is, uh, you know, I would have guessed by the image that it's a fulling machine. It actually says it's a stretching machine. And one of the things they could do with the fabric is stretch it, probably to make it thinner and finer, um, but it also made it probably weaker. Uh, so there is sort of the, there's only a certain amount you can stretch a fabric um, before you're, you're not doing it any good. Yes, it, it, it's useful, but don't overdo it. Yes, hey, that's like life, right? It's true, moderation in all things. Right, and we have um, people sewing or doing tailoring. And this is a classic tailoring shop here. We have this, don't ask me why, but they tailor sitting down on a giant table up off the floor. They could be tailoring on the floor, but they are not. No. But they might as well be on the floor. But they, but not, right? But they need to like, keep everything clean. Right. right? Uh, but it's, it's very, and this, this classic sitting, you know, yeah. cross legs just that's, you just see that when you have a picture of it. Yeah. It's just This very is fun. a shop full of tailors. And, they, and of course, thank goodness they have a wonderful window. Yes, you got the giant window so you can get lots of uh, exterior light. You can even see someone using a pair of glasses there. So he's kind of like probably threading a needle. Um, there's even a furnace there and you can see an iron that's warming up. So you can do some pressing. And who knows what, if we could, you know, dig around under on the floor there to see what the tools are. And there's even a dog. Maybe that's why they have the table, so the right. dog can't <laughs> get up. Does not get fur on this time. This is one of those rooms you really want to walk into it. Yeah. And, and walk around and pick up the clothing they just made. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's tailoring. And there we are. Shoo! Um, over here on the, I guess... No, on the thing right next to you, there's there's Paley's new suit, and okay. then there's wool items that... Um, so, one of the reasons why wool is a big thing, um, and we talk about it, is because we have lots of wool things. We the, All the clothing and different items we make um, tend to be out of natural fibers that they would use in the 18th century. So, it's cotton, linen, wool, and a lot of things are wool. So, um, sashes that we have on our website... Mm -hmm. Hand woven yep. out of wool yarn. So just like the wool yarn we got here, we turn it into sashes. Um, knit the hats. You'll see me wear these all the time. Uh, Monmouth caps in, uh, on uh, episodes. Made I've just of, finished one. <laughs> made out of 100% um, wool. And fingerless gloves. Again, you'll see me wearing lots of uh, wool fingerless gloves. Where's your caps? Just what everybody needs. A longer red cap. 
Um, you know, you'll see, you, you go to the store today and you can find, um, you can find wool and socks, but almost never are they 100% wool. Generally, they're at best 50-50, if not it's like 20% wool. And um, we carry wool socks from the time period, nice super long wool socks. They're, uh, most of these are 100, are they 100? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, ribbed wool stockings. Ooh, they even have clocks in them. Aren't they pretty? Yeah, they got, they're nice. Can you see the clock? I don't know if you can see them, but they, yeah. they're very pretty. There's the clocking right there, right there. Um, and plain wool stockings. So nice heavy wool stockings. And the great thing about woolen coats, which is what I'm wearing here, woolen stockings, is that they can keep you warm whether they get wet or not. Yeah, it's still wet, it's not as warm, um, but they're really good in, in cold weather and in wet conditions like that. The, I talked about uh, wool felt, and again, our hats are woolen felt, and we do have this really fun book, Pele's New Suit. It was, was it a Sydney and Lauren yep, book? we had that when we were kids. Yeah, when we were kids. And uh, this one is fun. It's a little kid's book with illustrations. But it goes through um, Pele here needs new clothes. He's, he, they, they don't fit him anymore. And he needs new clothes. And so the book starts off and gives you the whole process. Uh, there's the sheep, and he shears the sheep. I don't know how he gets to be talented enough. He takes the wool to his grandmother, and she cleans it and cards it and spins it. And then um, they dye it. She goes to somebody else, and they dye it. And, um, and then finally he uh, – then you can even see there he is. He's, he's dyeing his – He's going to have blue, which is kind of sort of a classic uh, workman color. And then somebody weaves it, and the tailor, and it's very hilarious because there's a tailor, and he is <laughs> sitting on the table, <laughs> just like we looked at earlier. And then he has his new suit of clothes after working with all these different people in the book, and he comes out with this so. Mm -hmm. There you go. And he, he does little jobs for all of the yeah. people. Yes, in the right. it's book. great. So he has these other people have to do the work because he can't do it. And you know, and he like, like he gets the he brings in the wood for the person who's the tailor, right. and it just little chores for all the people right. who's helping him with, with his. So suit. great book for um, kids. If they're interested if you, you know, show kids what's going on with that. Um, one of the uh, we were talking we saw that newspaper uh, advertisement. And it talked about the different kinds of fabrics, shalloons, and all that. We have a dictionary of textiles and <laughs> all about the different kinds of crazy fabrics you have and what the terms mean. And um, you wouldn't think you would need a book this thick to explain all the different terms and types of things going on in textiles. But you do. Every week I try to get to <laughs> brand new members, uh, returning members. Uh, so these are YouTube members, both new and returning. Uh, Sean Donapel, Tim Kalila, um, F. Dominic, Jared Lubert, uh, Midwest Minuteman, Gail Incote, Rami Elzine, uh, let's see, Christopher Stalter, Tammy Kenton, there's uh, Human Filth again, and uh, there's uh, Something Army of Darkness, then there's David Kohler and Michael McCready, and uh, brand new Patreon folks, um, Lawrence Foster, Jonathan uh, Robertson, Stacey Lynch, Tim Pierce, um, somebody with a bunch of Q's and Z's and X's and those. I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, Scott, Marcus, Tembler, and Seth. And then New Town says Plus people. Uh, David Crowler, Ben Edwards, James Rice, and Jefferson. All those people uh, are incredibly helpful making the channel do what it does, helping us in a very, very direct manner. So thank that you very much. Me. I've, I've got another note, and this is a super chat from Diane Norkis, member for three years. So Woo! thank you so much. Do we have any questions? 
Okay, there were questions throughout it, but I think that they... Like, one of them was about dying, but it was before we got to the dying section. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, I think kind most of, of them it. we touched on in different instances. Or, hopefully, someone... It, they might have been too deep for our will knowledge, and hopefully someone in the chat helped them out. So, yeah. um, I do have another super chat. This is from Max R. Cool. Hey, Happy Max. Friday to everyone in the tavern. Yes. Thank you. It's been uh, wonderful to be in the Nutmeg Tavern. And... Uh, Whew, there's a lot of uh, information. I felt like uh, felt like I was the uh, fireman with the fire hose there. Psh, hold on, here comes more information about wool. And really just kind of scratching the surface. Very much so. Because, um, you know, each one of those topics you can go, you know, dig down deep, spinning, dying. You know, you could spend probably uh, a month, you know, a month-long live stream, you know, talking about dying. Well, if you use a copper pot, you know, it'll give you this color. And if you... <laughs> it's uh, pretty incredibly, uh, it can be fun and it's a, it's a, it's like so many of those things. It's a, um, a topic that just keeps going. So. There is a super chat from Colin K. A small tithe to atone for my extended absence. Matt sends his regards and promises he'll get around to watching your videos someday. Okay. And see, that's the nice thing. We just keep making them so the, the you yeah, know, there's more and more. Yeah, they're just stacking up. If you don't hurry up and start watching, you will <laughs> never get caught up. <laughs> and then there's a super chat from Speed and Style Tony. What were the most common colors used for different fabrics? Or, or the wool fabric specifically? <laughs> Yeah, well, um, you know, I think that different colors, and I this is only just off the top of my head, a lot of them are, uh, can be a little more difficult to achieve, and, um, and there are some that are really, really common and show up all the time, like the blues, you know, indigos, and those sorts of things. Um, you're going to see those a lot, and they're, you know, an inexpensive color. And then some colors are kind of set aside for particular things. So sometimes it's, um, you know, it's like color coding for, uh, for um, you know, social status and all that kind of thing. And that like can be... black tended to be used for right. higher-end professions. It yeah. was a hard dye to achieve in a, in a nice, lasting color. Exactly, and it kind of can turn to a rusty or a mm -hmm. blue color or strange colors. Um, and and there were regions that are very uh, color specific. So the people in East Anglia and New England were very into the sad colors. And what what are the sad colors? Right, like that pea green and the muted yeah. brown and the gray. And which is like I don't think they were wearing the chartreuse green, but someone right. was. There were yeah. right those were in demand in other areas. So, but yes. that like that yeah. red, the the blue. And probably black it probably are the base colors that right. are very, very, and brown and green because they are easier to achieve. Yeah, so there, you know, these, there's really a, even just the kind of the, the culture behind the colors, uh, whether they're inexpensive or, or they're just popular in some different areas, uh, really kind of a, a really fun and, and deep topic, which is one that I don't think we, we really can grasp. We think 18th century, they were all like cavemen and they only wore brown, you know, but uh, it's, it's not like that. Okay, I think we're all good. We did it. Incredible wool. It just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everyone for their amazing uh, participation here in the uh, in the live stream. Maybe you're watching this in replay and, and you're just, you know, it's like, oh, I just want to set something and hear this guy yak on about uh, 18th century wool. Um, thank you for being part of that audience and um, helping us do what we do and kind of, kind of, you know, if we can't understand or at least get a glimpse of what things were like 200 years ago, 250 years ago, how do we understand what's going on today? I don't know. Um, thank you for being, well, what you're doing. Thank you for watching today, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend.